Um, so because it's going to be recorded, I want to invite you to keep your microphones muted. And if you have any concerns about privacy, please feel free to turn your cameras off uh, if you, again, if you don't want to be on camera. Uh, and now, without further ado, let me introduce our two speakers today. Natalia Alexian is professor of modern Jewish history at Tura College, Graduate School of Jewish Studies in New York City. She has published widely on Polish Jewish issues. She is the author of Where To? The Zionist Movement in Poland, 1944 and 1950, which appeared in 2002 in Polish. And she's also the co-editor with Anthony Polonsky and Brian Horowitz of Writing Jewish History in Eastern Europe, as well as numerous articles in specialized journals. She's currently working on a book about the so-called cadaver affair at European universities in the 1920s and 30s, and also on a project dealing with daily lives of Jews in hiding in Galicia during the Holocaust. And of course, today, she's going to talk about her new book, uh, Conscious History. Um, Naomi Seidman is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department for the Study of Religion and the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto. She is the author of many books. Let me just mention a few. A Marriage Made in Heaven, The Sexual Politics of Hebrew and Yiddish, Faithful Renderings, Jewish-Christian Difference and the Politics of Translation, The Marriage Plot, or How Jews Fell in Love with Love and with Literature, and most recently, uh, just two years ago, she published Sarah Schenerer and the Base Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition. Uh, Natalia, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so, uh, so much, Francesca. And uh, thank you for the invitation. And thank you to Naomi. Uh, it means a lot to me, not only intellectually, but there's all kinds of circles that are closing uh, in us having this conversation um, about, about interwar uh, cohort of uh, Polish Jews interested in writing Jewish history. Um, and I want to also thank you all for joining and I can see some names of friends and colleagues and I'm extremely moved because I know how tough the competition for your time vis-a-vis uh, -vis computer screen is and it's Friday and um, uh, all sorts of tense time uh, of cleaning is starting for some of us. So uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, let me uh, share the screen. Um, so uh, this, is a, this is a book with a very long gestation uh, time, not only due to uh, COVID, uh, but it started um, in a graduate seminar, uh, which I was taking uh, at NYU as a, as a doctoral student um, and uh, reading as an assignment, uh, reinventing the Jewish past, European Jewish intellectuals and the Zionist return to history, uh, David Meyer's fantastic and inspiring book. And I remember thinking, first of all, how interested it, uh, interesting um, historiography could be, something I didn't know, um, and that I was uh, curious how those questions that he raised uh, about primarily German Jewish intellectuals, how they would work if they were to be applied to uh, uh, Polish Jewish um, uh, scholars, students of history, uh, intellectuals, but it also had a personal angle for me, uh, one that only as one of the many circles became clear when I was finishing the book, which is that one of the students that I looked at whose um, MA thesis I read in the um, archive of Warsaw University, um, Franciszka Gustawa Wiesenfeld, whom you see here, uh, was in fact mother of my first Hebrew teacher, uh, whom I met um, in her Moshav house where I was taken for one Shabbat as a favorite student of my, of my teacher, um, and who really wanted to tell me about her experiences at the Institute of Jewish Studies in Warsaw. Now I was young and silly, 
And uh, while I was interested in stories of the past, I didn't understand she was actually a witness and a participant in a project that I will spend uh, many years researching, researching and writing about. But it also makes me realize how this project has an afterlife in ways in which uh, I might not even always be aware of because Franciszka Gustava Wiesenfeld, after her um, emigration to Mandatory Palestine in 1937, became Safrira Azrieli, and this is the name under which she taught for many years Jewish history in various uh, high schools uh, in the north. Uh, the story is a story in this book is a story about a cohort of um, uh, scholars, of public intellectuals, of teachers, rabbis, journalists, um, communal activists, um, people who were wearing many hats. But what brought them together is um, their understanding or rather sense of immense importance that uh, Jewish history in general, Eastern European uh, Jewish history and in particular Polish Jewish history had and while this is a project that starts in a book with a 19th century um, writing of Jewish history the focus on the book of the book is really on the interwar uh, period which is when Polish Jewry is the largest European community the center of much intellectual communal religious economic uh, uh, activities and some uh, um, experimentation. So you see here pictures of, um, of abitur, of high school diplomas and some of the papers, as well as one publication of a, a book uh, written by one of the students that I looked at, one book that is still being very much cited uh, in the studies of uh, Galician Jewish history. But uh, my sense is that of that, whole cohort, only few people are now known um, uh, more broadly, especially Emanuel Ringelblum, uh, thanks to uh, Sam Casso's uh, magisterial um, work, who will write uh, our history. But this is a cohort that has a group of teachers, some of them formal, some of them more informal, uh, and institutions uh, uh, and professional contexts in which they meet, discuss, present their work. This is one of very few situations in which this uh, Polish Jewish historical project was formally presented internationally uh, in the Polish professional context, as you can see at the International Conference of Historical Studies. But while you see here at the table all men, uh, among them Philip Friedman, uh, um, um, Mayer Bauerban, uh, Rafael Mahler, uh, Itzhak um, Ignacy uh, Schipper. Um, this group has a lot of women. If you look especially at the younger generation, um, like Zafrira, Franciszka, Gustawa, at least one third of the students studying Polish Jewish history uh, and studying uh, at the Institute of Judaic Studies in Warsaw are uh, women. Uh, so that was something that was for me very interesting, this uh, experimentation in the active presence of uh, women. Um, what also is extremely interesting in this group is that it operates as a nonpartisan group. Uh, we all know about how politically divided uh, a Polish Jewish community was uh, before the Holocaust, during the Holocaust, about various parties, um, youth groups, and how often in the same family, various siblings would join um, competing uh, political organizations and, and groupings. But uh, in the historical project, I argue in the book, this is something that uh, Jews, especially of the younger generation, the, the generation that came of age in the Second Polish Republic that went to uh, secondary schools and university in the Second Polish Republic, they came together. So you had here 
Bundes. I'm here waving at uh, Jake, uh, Jake Jacobs, whom I saw uh, signing in uh, with Lip Lipman Somber. Uh, we have um, Zionists of various stripes from Mizrahi to uh, Palazzi on left. Of course, uh, Emmanuel Rengelblum being the most known um, member and deeply involved in uh, politics of Palazzian uh, links intellectuals, intellectual, but also uh, a terrible uh, illegal uh, Xerox made at the University of Warsaw of a uh, student ID of Naomi's uh, father, uh, who belonged to this group uh, as well, took this cohort and his application for sending him his MA thesis devoted to the Jewish uh, communal um, administration organization overseeing it in the 19th century uh, uh, that he uh, wrote under Meyer Bauerban, whose picture you saw uh, earlier. Uh, what uh, brings this cohort together is also uh, a project of writing both academic history. Uh, they are um, enrolling at universities, they, they, they receive graduate degrees, many of them while struggling through uh, economic difficulties, but also their involvement in public history. And in some ways, it's a project of surprising optimism, uh, given uh, the deteriorating economic and political situation of, uh, of Polish Jews, uh, a sense that history is a tool that can bring um, Polish uh, Jews and non-Jewish non Poles closer, that it can provide, as Jakub Szatsky wrote in 1947, ammunition in the struggle um, um, of Jewish masses for their rights. Um, and so it's something that uh, these young people believed they were participating in, both uh, in terms of um, communicating with the Polish non-Jewish audience, but also with their own community. And I think that this is interesting. On the one hand, a cohort that writes a minority history, but also that writes uh, to the largest uh, Jewish community in Europe with a great sense of rootedness in history and the importance of telling the story to uh, to Polish uh, Jews. It's also a cohort, I believe, of fantastically interesting intellectual um, experimentation. And for me, this woman whose fate I don't know, her records end in a student file. I didn't find her in any list of survivors. Neither does she, does she have a record in a Yad Vashem um, a database of, of uh, victims of the Holocaust. Uh, uh, a young woman from Łódź who, um, as you can see in a snapshot of her student uh, document, lived in the heart of Jewish Warsaw at Novolipie during her studies. And she wrote an MA thesis demanding um, more research into the history of uh, Jewish women, demanding that this future research should be done in comparative framework between Jewish and non-Jewish women, and that there being uh, women, she doesn't of course use the term gender, but that them being uh, women uh, had more uh, in common for their um, daily life, for their um, educational aspirations, for their family patterns, possibly then uh, them being Jewish, uh, things that seem to be uh, very much um, known to us as kind of uh, research agendas, but she's writing it uh, in uh, 1930s. So um, I wanted to bring to um, the, the voices of this cohort, both in terms of their research and in, ter in terms of their social context, in terms of their limited professional opportunities and the paths they, they pursued, again, as activists, writers, journalists, communal activists, um, um, in the case of Hillel Zeidman, um, the makers of a future never completed project of creating the archive of Polish Jewish uh, history in Warsaw. Thank you very much.
Naomi, whenever you're ready, it, the floor oh, is yours. Thank you. Um, I don't know what I was waiting for there. Um, thank you so much. I, 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 I'm sure you can imagine, Natalia, you know, and uh, everybody else here, how, how moving this is to me and how much I learned, how, how deeply I understood something about my father from your work that I hadn't entirely understood. But let me postpone that conversation for a minute. And, and there's something else that was very interesting to me, which is um, the, the ways in which you were able to see something that's often invisible to us, which is the ideologies that move us, right? The, the, the questions that we ask to us seem obvious maybe, or, or, or how it is we work seems obvious, be, um, but it's ideological. And you, I think, did some really interesting work to understand what that ideology was. And in thinking about that and thinking about how sometimes we're blind to our own ideological inclinations. I wonder if it makes a difference that you have such an interesting academic history yourself that you have two, I think you have two PhDs, right? One from the University of Warsaw, one from NYU. Um, you studied in two different languages and, and you know, worked in many, many other languages. Um, and you also worked in two very different contexts. And I wonder if that's one of the things that allowed you to see what made this group distinct, not just the comparison with German Jewish history, but also, um, you know, what it is that makes a, a professional training um, have a certain ideological character. So first of all, tell us what that ideological character is just, you know, briefly, and then tell me whether I'm right that there's some, there's some benefit that you got from this complicated and no doubt, you know, difficult academic history that uh, is your own. Thank you, Naomi, uh, for this. Um, I am sensing that there is a possibility of a compliment there. So I'm embracing this question wholeheartedly. Um, oh, and I forgot <laughs> to mention how great your book is. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was beautifully, beautifully uh, um, alluded to. Uh, uh, I, I think it, it's it, there is a lot in this question. So let me let me sort of think uh, think aloud. Um, in terms of their um, ideological inclination, and and I like this phrase uh, because it it implies um, certain uh, search. Uh, um, for for answers that are political um, and and in this sense I think what is making them unique um, and uh, um, something that uh, the the cohort that uh, David Myers looked at uh, is so different is that my guys if I can say so my my men and women of Polish Jewish history uh, they uh, they enter the profession in a very particular moment uh, of Polish historiographical um, uh, enterprise and so to a large extent they are shaped by that project as well. There is a certain duality. Polish historiography in the early 20s uh, has this um, hunger of catching up, uh, catching up after uh, partitions. So there is a sense of uh, a country victimized by 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 a country that was erased from the from the map of of europe and we didn't have we as a as a intellectual project of poland we didn't have the institutions uh, the support the state framework that france and um and uh, britain had and there is a certain complex of western ba backwardness vis-a-vis -vis, uh, west to which Poland continues to aspire today. If you if you read political commentaries today, they are always somewhat tense about belonging to the West, but being on the on the margin of that Western European universe. And so, I when I read um, uh, Emmanuel Ringelblum's introduction to the first issue of Fiunga um, uh, Historica, where he writes, you know, we don't have the 
uh, we don't have that kind of state support that Polish historians have, and we need to create it ourselves. There is a, there is a sort of parallel sense of, uh, uh, of the deprivation and the need uh, to come together uh, even more strongly. Uh, um, and I think that there, that there is a degree of internalization of, of a Polish uh, um, historiographical project of uh, we lost a lot of time, we need to catch up. Uh, and Jewish historians write with the same sense of, you know, we are behind, we're behind other historical projects. Um, and another ideological inclination, I think, is almost an obsession of uh, writing Jews into Polish history. And I'm, I mean obsession in a very positive way, um, but, but repeating in, in various ways, uh, explicitly and less explicitly, that there is no Polish history without Jewish history. Look at this, look at that. You can't study uh, um, urban history, you can't study trade, you can't study culture, you can't study history of medicine, and the list goes on and on. Without us, you you do need us to have a sense of your own history, um, and this is something that some Polish non-Jewish historians share, and so they are able to meet uh, with this understanding of um, Jews, Jewish historians bringing to the picture part important part of Polish history, but that of course assumes ideologically a very particular vision of Polish history, which is an inclu inclusive vision uh, of not only ethnic Poles um, and preferably from, especially from 19th century on a Catholic. Um, and so that is there, is, there is an element of tension, but also a promise. Now to my own um, heroic uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, biography, I, I can only say that it's interesting to me to, to see how long it took for me to understand that this is a profoundly personal uh, project. I mean, for a long time when I was doing research and even be, be, beginning to, to rewrite the dissertation into a book and struggling, I was under the impression that I'm rewriting a dissertation. And I remember simply a dissertation. And I remember a conversation with Karen Auerbach, um, whom I, I'm sending best regards uh, uh, at AJS, uh, la one long uh, post-dinner uh, chamomile tea we shared. And she looked at me and she said, but you, you studied in Warsaw. You studied with people who studied with people whom you're studying. Uh, this is obviously personal. And I looked at her with horror. Um, and, and then I realized that um, Marceli Handelsmann, who was a, um, a fascinating figure, very ambivalent about his own Jewishness, P Polish patriot and uh, and supporter of Piłsudski and all things beautiful and liberal about Poland and who built a future Institute of History at the uh, University of Warsaw, his uh, photograph and large photographs was hanging over the reading room uh, in the Institute of History where I spent my 20s. Um, and somehow I didn't connect the dots until Karen kind of spelled it out for me. So yes, it, it, is a, it is a very personal book. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I'm sorry to be personal myself, but- well, I showed the imagine, picture of your father, so I think I gave you all the right to, to be- You did say, uh, maybe people picked up on it from the way the photo looked, but you, I think you left out the most important point, which is that my father was a Hasid. My father came from a Hasidic family. He was part of the Aguda. Um, you know, you said the whole ideological spectrum, but then how about, you know, my father? Um, was he, if it's okay, can I ask, how unique was that? How unusual was that? And how, um, and, what did that mean for orthodoxy of the interwar period? I mean, were orthodox Jews writing different kinds of history? Um, how did they speak to their colleagues? I mean, what were their 
with their, I mean, I know that my father faced some opposition from his Hasidic family when he wanted to go to the university, um, but with their Hasidic girls and women in that crowd, I know Naomi, my father had a, a friend. May I share the anecdote that your mother shared with me? Absolutely. About, uh, so uh, this, there is also, and Jack, I see what you're showing to the to the screen, but um, there is a there is an additional. Um, What's Jack showing? Uh, uh, the first page of. Uh, oh, my father's um, book. You seem to yes. um, So uh, I I actually had the pleasure of interviewing. Uh, Naomi's mother, <clears throat> and as I did, I didn't, I still didn't realize that she was <laughs> the mother of Naomi Zeitman. Somehow it existed for me in in in, in different uh, solar systems, but <laughs> um, but I remember uh, her um, telling me that when uh, when your father was uh, taking uh, evening classes towards his high school. Uh, diploma high school exams and you had to have a bitur you had to uh, graduate from uh, from high school with these uh, very demanding uh, examinations in in order to enroll uh, at the, any uh, department of of a university uh, so he was doing it at uh, at night uh, in secret and um, someone must have um noticed him and so he was asked by his um, by his rabbi if if this is true uh, and he said no but he had just passed the exams so technically <laughs> he was no longer taking those lessons he was done uh, and I think um, so this is this was the problem uh, in writing this book that there was there was a great deal of social history that I was craving to write, but I only had the sources that I could have, meaning uh, I was piecing it together from um, absolute fragments and a, a lot of those fragments were institutional records. Uh, and only that much of personal friction of family um, disappointment, uh, you know, about um, uh, a young woman not marrying, but instead uh, uh, taking more classes uh, in Jewish history at Warsaw University, gets to the files of of, of a student. Uh, so my my intuition uh, um, and impression from um, uh, memoiristic recollections uh, that. Um, are readable in in the accounts that your father put together, in the accounts of uh, Moshe Krone, who uh, completed a rabbinical seminary, Tach Kemoni, where Meyer Bauerban taught uh, Jewish history and was kind of introducing students to all kinds of uh, male students, obviously all male students, to all kinds of uh, dangerous um, uh, ideas about historical thinking about Jewish past um, um, and who Moshe, Moshe Krona is the father of David Asaf. Uh, so from these um, recollections, it's clear that the, they, they had uh, possibly um, not a easy path to university pursuit of uh, Jewish knowledge. Uh, but there are several of them that we know of. Uh, there is uh, Chaim Simcha Babat, who wrote about uh, sanctuary laws uh, in Jewish communities. There is Felix Hafner, who wrote uh, actually a, Tal a Talmudic MA uh, on um, Antonius versus Rabbi. Uh, I have um, uh, also a sense of several women who are described by um, uh, Rafael Mahler as coming from Hasidic families, but by the time they are participating in the meetings of a historian circle that um, Mahler, Ringelblum and uh, Bella uh, Schilkraut organized, they're already communists or radical left-wing Zionists. So this is a question. If what brought them to this academic pursuit of Jewish uh, history was already uh, their path towards um, radical uh, politics or history brought them 
to it. Uh, but I think that this is a cohort of people who, uh, who are diverse, not just because they belong to Bund and to Mizrahi and to Palaitzion uh, links and who are young stars of Aguda, like, like your father, but that they are in conversation uh, with all these intellectual and ideological projects and possibly moving. I have this one, um, one scan that I uh, didn't put on the presentation, but uh, it's, um, it's a student ID of a member of the Young Historian Circle, um, uh, Helena Chamarkovna, who signs her name on her student ID as Helena Chamarkovka, Chamarkovna, but in a formal part that is filled by a university um, secretary, uh, she is Hanna Chamarka. So now, um, did she become Helena uh, Chamarkovna? Is this the university that made her? Um, and what does it really mean? And again, in those student files, um, students, um, historians um, change their uh, mother tongue when they declare uh, you know, Hebrew one year, uh, obviously an ideological statement, uh, Yiddish another year, and then the following semester it's Polish. I mean, there is a great deal of linguistic, political, cultural um, richness um, and nuance. And, and history uh, is one of those projects that uh, I believe brings them together and makes this conversation uh, possible. Francesca, do we have time for one more? You, you, you have time for as many as you'd like. Uh, I just, I have one more question. I'm, I'm really curious about. Thank you so much. So interesting. Um, and I, you know, when you talk about what the fragmented sources are, that's how I feel about my father's life, right? It's just putting together pieces, even having lived with the men. I mean, fortunately for all those years. Um, so the question I have is one of the things that you talk about that's so interesting is that this, this history was not only conscious, it's such an interesting concept, right? Conscious history. It was also, I'd love for you to say a little bit more, it was also um, dialogic. So these, the, there was an implicit conversation going on that you describe uh, correcting misconceptions about Jews, what their economic role was, um, how they, interacted despite their insularity with, with non-Jews, etc. cetera. Um, but there's also a really interesting chapter about how because of the real dearth of job opportunities, almost all of these um, historians made a living outside the academy, outside the ivory tower and working as journalists and very often as, as teachers in, in Jewish schools, secondary schools, etc. cetera. Um, and I think, you know, you and I know that um, one of the, and, and so that most of their students were Jewish. And um, I think it's one of the aspects of teaching classrooms full of Jewish students, not that all of our students are Jewish, that you're correcting misconceptions, not only with, you know, about Jews to non-Jews, but particularly with young Jews. So they go, they, they get a, you know, they get an education in a day school or they hear things from their parents. And it's one of the pleasures of life in the classroom that you, you know, you burst all their bubbles and you disappoint them and you, 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 uh, you can see their, their head spinning, right? So I, I was very aware of what the misconceptions that non-Jews had of Jews, but what were the, what were the correctives? Let's say the internal Jewish correctives mm -hmm that this generation of historians um, were performing on Jewish ideas of themselves, if that ever came up um, in such your- Such a great reading. question. It is such a great question. And, and again, um, I, uh, I came too late uh, to, to this project, meaning, um, you know, I, I interviewed your mother and was wonderful. And I interviewed um, um, uh, Israel Biederman's uh, widow, um, luckily uh, still still managed to, to, to talk to her. Um, but, but a lot of these conversations were, um, 
what people remember of of being told um and and in the in the writing um of people who were students um they don't, uh, you know, there, some Iskorbicher uh, mention reading Meyer Bauerban's uh, book and how they were amazed then to come to University of Warsaw and, and, and meet him. And again, we had all gone through this, you know, meeting the authors of the books we, we loved. Um, um, not often textbooks in school, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, meeting the authors. Um, I think that it's not so much bursting misconceptions. I think it's a, in some ways, it's a very positivist project that is going on in schools uh, to the extent that again, I, I could, I could uh, look at it, which is um, very conscious uh, tying students to the place where they live, uh, creating for them a sense, a personal sense of rootedness. And I think it matters also because we're talking about a generation that uh, went through tremendous um, uh, uprooting during World War One. I. Uh, I see all these students who are born in, um, you know, in a pale of settlement, and then with the Bolshevik Revolution, the families move to to Poland, and so they start a school um, often in Russian, and then they continue in uh, in Polish or in uh, Polish and Yiddish, depending on the kind of school that they attend. Um, and so uh, I, I've seen several of my historians, uh, Bella Mandelsberg Schildkraut does, it, does this in, uh, in uh, Lublin, um, uh, Philip Friedman, uh, I would love to one day write a biography of him. Uh, uh, Philip Friedman does this in Łódź. Um, they take uh, students to, um, to see the synagogues, the cemeteries, the historical uh, sites of memory, of Jewish memory in those towns, but they also take them to Christian sites, which I mm. think is very interesting for students of Jewish gymnasia, especially. And so that, that um, making them aware of the historical nuance, historical context in places where they live, uh, I think is very much part of that project. Um, then there is the question of writing guidebooks. I think it's the same um, sense of tying Jews to the places and to Poland, uh, Poland as such. And something that I find that goes beyond your question about school, um, but something that I find very interesting, I think there is an element, and I didn't go into it in, 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 in a book, I, it occurred to me when I was reading proofs and thinking, oh, I wish I could add another chapter, uh, which is how, um, how there is also um, a connection between class and uh, you know, Polish jury is Polish jury, of course, you know, we always repeat this mantra, three and a half million, um, probably more on the eve of, uh, of the uh, Holocaust. Uh, but this is also the working class Polish Jews, uh, the merchants Polish Jews, the intelligentsia Polish Jews. And there are aspects of this Polish Jewish history that are very much um, tied to to their specific context. So uh, Bauaban and Shatsky are giving lectures to the Association of Jewish Merchants. Um, um, Ringelblum and Mahler take trips to Częstochowa to give uh, lectures in evening classes for the workers. Um, I mean, Jewish workers are in Yiddish. Um, so so there, is, there is also that aspect of, of sort of custom made histories of of people who were like you, you know, working class Jews or merchants that struggled with anti-Jewish uh, measures. And I think it's very much connected with boycott going on at the time, you know, or, or uh, giving lectures to uh, Jewish veterans about the history of uh, Jewish patriotism and Jewish uh, participation in Poland's struggle uh, for independence. So, so it's also very um, rich in the kind of offerings that it has for this huge Jewish community. Natalia, what you just described is basically how I feel about your book. It's you have given me some piece of my own past 
that explains me to myself, um, explains the, you know, the, the, the something very, um, something in our house about that feeling of a, a, a bright future that, that, that never came to pass. Um, the potential, you know, the, the, my father never was a professor and I'm so fortunate and I feel so blessed that he lived long enough just to see me at the very beginning of my work as a professor. So, so just general thanks for what you've illuminated, but also personal. I have a million more questions, but I'm also really curious to hear what people have to say. I mean, there are a lot of people in this audience that know a lot more than I do about this. So let's uh, hear from them. We're gonna open uh, the floor for questions. So feel free to use the chat box, just put your name or just say question in the chat box and I'll, I'll call on you and you'll be unmuted. But uh, while we're waiting for people to- Thank you, Naomi. Just book your, book your, your spot. Um, I also wanted to add my thanks. This has been such a warm conversation, so enriching. Um, and um, it's, been, it's been wonderful. So uh, there's so many threads that we could pick uh, from, you know, to move to different directions of the conversation. One, I have, I have one question, um, which has to do with the uh, emerging fields of historiography during this time period. So when you look at your historians, you talked about their interest in local history, their interest in, in uh, creating roots for uh, their audiences and teaching them about uh, historical issues that would be immediately relevant for them. I'm curious about the chronological span. Um, do they mostly look at the recent past or do they look at the more, you know, what we would, today we would call the early modern past? Um, and I'm curious about, you mentioned in your introduction, the international reach, their international ambition. So they're writing for the Polish Jewish community, but they're also interested in reaching Jewish communities outside of Poland. And uh, because the Polish Jewish community has such a uh, extraordinary and unique history, uh, you know, just in terms of its sheer size compared to the rest of the Western European Jewish communities, I'm curious how that history was received. Uh, if was it read in Yiddish or was it read in was it translated and it circulated mm. in Jewish communities in Western Europe? In Western Europe, yeah. This is a, this is a great uh, great question. Um, um, a number of them. So in in terms of chronology, uh, I, again, I had to remind myself uh, reading um, the publications and reading the unpublished uh, um, uh, thesis um, and dissertations, um, which are mostly preserved, uh, but not all of them. Um, university archive was bombed, and then there are um, obvious uh, signs of um, um, mice and such um, uh, in, the, in the papers. Uh, but um, what I find interesting is, yes, there is, there is, a, 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 there is a lot of uh, uh, thesis and dissertations and articles that look into uh, medieval and early modern, early modern especially, um, with, with which I think would be interesting for you with definite uh, focus on um, or, or um, zooming uh, onto economic history, uh, which, which is what a lot of Polish uh, historians uh, do at the time. Uh, there's a great deal of interest in urban history and, and writing about um, merchant networks and such. And, and Jewish historians do a, a similar kind of uh, work. Uh, what I find fascinating is the amount of work that is already being done on um, modern history. And again, if you think about the fact that it's 1930s, uh, them writing on 1980s, uh, uh, 18, I'm sorry, 1890s, uh, early 1900, uh, and even as uh, radically as um, eve of World War I, uh, you know, while um, history and historians, uh, professional historians are still deciding how close uh, how close is too close? Um, they are certainly 
pushing the envelope on this. Um, and, um, and in that sense, I guess that context of relevance and, and the presentism present in their work is very, very visible. But my, my sense is that even when they write about um, no, Vad Arbar thought it's so closely connected to a discussion about Jewish autonomy in Poland. Uh, it's it's at the back of the conversation, um, very contemporary uh, questions about their um, international, um, transnational, global uh, reach. They publish, uh, especially the, the older generation, uh, gets to uh, still publish um, on both ends, meaning in the German uh, Jewish journals and in um, Dubnov led uh, um, uh, Jevreska Starina, um, uh, etc. But uh, there is a little bit of publications in mandatory Palestine, uh, but they don't have um, that much of a success. And, and again, this is a question. The project is interrupted uh, in, in a dramatic circumstances. And so the, to what degree um, this was the beginning of, of Polish Jewish historiographical um, uh, influence on, and they certainly formulated as such, something that you said yourself, they have very much a sense that, um, that there is too, too much of a focus on, on German, uh, German Jewish historiographic uh, uh, tradition, uh, that Berlin is not the only way, the only lens to think uh, through and that they have, as Polish Jews, that they have a particular contribution to be made, uh, not just as Eastern European Jews, uh, but specifically as Polish Jews. Um, and there, you know, there are initiatives uh, about creating networks, organizing conferences, but but it also meets the. Um, practical uh, limitations uh, that were already mentioned. I mean, they, they can't publish. Uh, publishing is becoming increasingly impossible. And I found um, you know, younger generation in some letters bickering that the, uh, really the only person that is able to publish is Balaban because he has enough of a cachet. Um, they always need to find a, pa a patron, you know, a, wealth, a, a relatively wealthy Jewish community that will sponsor uh, its own history um, uh, here and there. But, but it's a struggle. So I think it also puts, uh, puts uh, uh, breaks on this uh, broader project. I think we have a question from Glenn Diner. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Hi, thanks so much. What a fascinating conversation. Um, I, I'm gonna take a risk here, but I really sense that a lot of this history writing is geared, as you say, towards Polish-Jewish relations. And I think there's a patriotic edge to a lot of it. And it leads me to wonder, do, does anybody address anti-Jewish violence in all of this, uh, in this entire project? Because I get the sense, I mean, most of what I've read you know, by Balaban, Shipper, and et cetera. Be quietly. Is, is, um, yeah. is you can't address anti-Jewish violence. And so there's this enormous hole, right? there's this even suppression that is disturbing to me. And it leads me to start thinking about Saul Baron and his whole reaction against the lacrimose conception of Jewish history. Maybe this is part of this project because you know, Baron also is uncomfortable dealing with anti-Jewish violence. He comes from Galicia. And, and so I just, I, I wonder if um, we're, we're dealing with, uh, there's a darker side to all this, which is a silencing of, of victims, of suffering, and a fear of perhaps alienating, you know, Pol Polish Catholics and, and denying this, look, you're just coming out of a wave of pogroms, right, in 1919, and then uh, 1918, 1919, and even before that, Bialystok, and uh, you could go back to 1881. So if you could just address that, please. That's a great question, and I think you are very uh, right in your, um, um, you know, you have more than a sense. I mean, you're reading some of, some of my uh, sources and uh, historiographical uh, literature. Um, 
I think I wouldn't quite go as far as to say it's silencing because when you read, um, um, especially uh, the Yiddish uh, uh, language uh, publications, and for obvious reasons, there is a little bit more of a sense of um, uh, space to say things. Um, it, but even 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 in Polish, I mean, in, in Polish, if you look at uh, Meyer Bauerband's history of Jews in uh, uh, Kraków and Kazimierz uh, and some other local studies, uh, um, anti-Jewish uh, violence um, and anti-Jewish prejudice, anti-Jewish legislations um, uh, and violence is there, but it's certainly not made a centerpiece and there is always a, a, a some degree of framing it as a foreign influence um, which which again is a is a theme that is very very familiar in the contemporary discourse as well right um, so um, um, there is either um, a German monk come coming to uh, Poznan and giving a fiery uh, um, uh, speech uh, which starts violence or um, or there is a, a nefarious Russian influence that brings to Poland that essentially foreign uh, element of Jew hating. So it's not quite as crude. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that uh, historians really see it as utterly unpolish phenomenon, but the effort is certainly to frame it in a way that uh, that is palatable uh, to uh, to Polish uh, audience. And again, uh, in this dramatic moment when you uh, you're all. Uh, well experienced publishing uh, authors. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, everybody goes through it, but I, I really felt reading my own proofs uh, a few months ago that uh, if I was now doing it again, I would have probably squeezed this um, pleasing to the Polish non-Jewish audience aspect more uh, uh, because some of these statements of patriotism um, are, almost um, too good to be true. I mean, um, Moses Shore, for example, makes a, a, the speech about um, uh, Jewish devotion and loyalty, uh, eternal uh, gratitude to Poland, uh, um, a few uh, months after the pogrom in Lwów uh, in uh, uh, November 1918. Uh, at the time I read it as in the context of continuity of a narrative of, of Polish Jewish brotherhood and, and, and um, this kind of, yes, what you mentioned, the um, Jews are not victims um, uh, of persecution only, we have thrived here, but, but uh, it can also be seen as um, really, really strong efforts of, um, becoming palatable as authors but yeah I, I think I think I think it's not uh, silencing I think is maybe too strong but they are certainly aware of how far they can go uh, in uh, in writing about violence we have a the next question by Yanis Tsibigakis it's very broad so if that's okay, I'm just gonna reword re it, reframe it for the sake of our conversation on Polish Jewish historian. Um, and I think uh, Mr. Tsibigakis was curious about rifts, different uh, ideological stances that emerge uh, rel relatively to class and locality among Jewish historians. Uh, he's asking about historians over time, but let's just narrow it down to Polish Jewish historians during the time that you've studied. Um, the cla the, the, again, whether class and, and whether differences in class and differences mm. in regional provenance have, uh, I guess, yeah. an impact on historians and how those are explored by historians. The regional, the the regional is my favorite question, uh, but, but I'll say something about the class as well. Uh, there, uh, without a doubt, Galicia holds a palm um, uh, of, um, of uh, providing um, many of the, of the uh, 
historians that I'm writing about. Uh, Naomi's uh, uh, father is, is one example. And in fact, several of these Orthodox, uh, young Orthodox historians are all coming from Galicia. Now, I think it would require another study and maybe another book that I won't write um, uh, and more digging into uh, Orthodox um, um, journals and newspapers. Um, maybe I'm missing a, a, a cohort that did exist uh, coming from uh, the pale, former Pale of Settlement, but it seems that uh, there is uh, there is something to be said about a Galician context of Polish uh, and Polonized education since second half of 19th century, uh, relatively welcoming uh, a cohort of uh, scholars at universities. In fact, a lot of high school or gymnasium students uh, who became uh, interested in writing Jewish history write about the influence of their Polish teachers of history who encouraged them when they were uh, in uh, high schools. And these are these are um, state public state uh, gymnasia, uh, not not necessarily private Jewish ones. Uh, so so Galicia certainly is unique, although I do see, especially in the 30s, uh, among both men and women, uh, those coming from um, Eastern so-called borderlands and, and former Congress Poland. As for class, that's a great, great question. My sense is that um, uh, you have, uh, you have scholars who come from somewhat of a privileged milieu uh, because this, it is easier to go through gymnasium and graduate and even dream about uh, university training. And um, just like today, um, humanities is not exactly perceived as a fantastic investment if you're in your uh, upward mobility in the future. Uh, families are much more willing to um, to suffer deprivation and, and to sacrifice uh, when, when uh, their sons, preferably, uh, enroll in uh, medical studies. Um, you, you studying history or, or um, philology um, is much more problematic, right? It will give you a chance to teach in a gymnasium, um, which is a respectable uh, profession, but how many positions are there uh, given that Polish uh, state gymnasia are not exactly well welcoming with open arms uh, uh, Jews to teach uh, history or Polish language. Uh, so um, I think that there is a certain degree of um, of choice made by people who simply can afford it, which is not to say that you don't have people coming from uh, more uh, uh, modest means. And in the late 30s, second half of the 30s, especially, uh, almost every student file that I looked at had students begging for deferring the, the fees uh, every semester. And, and part of this particularly moving aspect of, of looking at the files, uh, not having um, ego documents uh, that much was seeing students that were still owing to Warsaw University for uh, their exams or classes and the payment was to be made in 1941, 1942. Um, and, you know, I was looking at it knowing what will be happening uh, in 1942 and um, how unlikely it was that they ever paid those, uh, uh, those debt. But, um, but just one more sentence, and I'm looking at the time. Um, Bella, um, Bella mandelsberg Schildkraut, for example, who writes uh, very uh, much uh, uh, with interest in uh, uh, fate and history of working, working class Jews, as it were. Uh, she comes from a well-to-do family in, in Lublin. She can afford uh, going to Warsaw to study, not only for MA, but then for a doctoral degree. Um, 
without a doubt for me, because of the support of her family, but then she's Palacian uh, links. She is, um, she's radical left, Zionist left. So her writing is much more re a reflection of her politics than of her social background, or class background as it were. But thank you for this question. The next question, I think Bernie wanted to expand Glenn's question, Bernie Cooperman, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, hi. Thank you very much for hi Natalia. Uh, I, thank you very much for the for the wonderful talk. And I'm only upset that the book is not going to be available until the end of April, uh, so I can't read it. I've read the articles about the, you know, the the other things that you've done in the Galician uh, uh, concentration of people who go to Poland and 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 and. Oh. The, the group you've been talking about today. But because I've been working about uh, on Baron, uh, I thought I, I maybe could ask you to expand on something that sort of is alluded to in, in Glenn's question. Uh, Glenn mentioned that Baron was not eager to talk about uh, anti-Jewish violence. It wasn't something he was interested in. And he associated it and you continued it with some with the feeling of the place of these people in Poland and their response to Polish nationalism and, and so forth. But there, there, there could be two other things and I'll just focus on one. Um, uh, uh, Baron, uh, uh, we think of him as a university educator, but he in fact had smicha and he right. went to Vienna to get smicha and yeah. he studied at the rabbinic school. And he says at one point in one of his uh, taped memoirs that he was very, very orthodox until at age uh, 22, he suddenly stopped and he sort of gave up on it. But, but while he was doing this, he was part of a different world of Jewish scholarship than the one you presented, not a world of um, uh, 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 the secular history of the Jews, but he got it. I know what he wrote about, but he, he got his education in a very rabbinic uh, environment. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that other side of this historiographical revolution. In other words, not the one that led to archival history and documenting the, the classes and, and, and the community history, but the side of the, the expansion of Jewish literary scholarship and Haskalah scholarship, which was rabbinically informed and which was linked to studying the Bible, studying the Talmud, studying Midrash in a secular way. But, but it had a, it seemed to me, had a totally different group of aficionados and so forth. And they all met together in the Semitics departments of universities where they all got the same degree, Mahler, and Baron studied in yep. Vienna, and that picture you showed, Baron is in that picture. Yes, I, I, yes. I mean, yes. it's astonishing. But, but that was like a separate world of intellectualism, not orthodox, but, but rabbinically based. Is, is, could you refer to that? world as well it's it's a great question and i and i mean it uh, it is a great question but in a way uh, my my project is is on what you call secular uh, um, uh, studies and i you know i looked at the dissertations and thesis and publications that came out um both in uh polish uh, uh, and Polish Jewish uh, historical uh, journals. Um, and they're all that kind of social, economic, institutional, cultural uh, history, um, looking at uh, Purim Spill, uh, you know, following Shipper, uh, Shipper's earlier, early research, and um, looking at Jewish, uh, early Jewish uh, newspapers, Haskalah, et cetera, et cetera, schools. Um, the, the, this other scholarship obviously exists, and I think that it's represented uh, quite well by the shift that takes place uh, institutionally when Balaban uh, leaves Tachkemoni uh, following his conflict with uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik because he is perceived as 
pushing the, the secular way of uh, pursuing uh, a Jewish history uh, too far. And his brother-in-law, Moshe Alter, uh, um, takes, uh, takes over. Um, Israel Oster, Osterzetzer, um, um, who is um, one of the faculty of the Institute of Jewish Studies, and connected to um, uh, uh, Oriental studies at Warsaw University is also part of this. So I agree fully uh, that there is a cohort that goes beyond studying you know, the Jews of Krakow, the Jews of Pinsk, the, the Jews of Dvinsk, uh, but, but, but I'm interested in that part much more. Now, if you look at I have one uh, kind of uh, problematic anecdote. Um, that I think touches on it. I interviewed um, one of uh, 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 um, uh students uh, at the Institute of uh, uh, Jewish Studies. He didn't um, pursue uh, history at the university. He studied uh, um, uh, pedagogy um, because he knew he was going to uh, make Aliyah. He was uh, interested um, uh, only uh, in training as a temporary solution. He was not planning to be a historian of Polish Jews working in Poland. Um, and he said to me, uh, it reminded me actually um, Sam Casso's um, experience with um, finding out that Ringelblum was a boring teacher uh, in the Yehudia, because my um, interlocutor said, Bauerbahn's Hebrew was really not up to, uh, up to the point that uh, we were so not impressed. Now he was from Grodno. He went to. He was from a Zionist family. Went to uh, a, a Hebrew a kindergarten, and he said that when Bauerbahn was trying to teach uh, his students at the Institute of Jewish Studies how to. Um, decipher uh, Jewish tombs, uh, tombstones, they were horrified that he was not quite as knowledgeable. Uh, and it seems to me that this, this, this project was indeed infused with a lot of interest in uh, going to uh, study Polish sources on Jews and then reading them together with Jewish sources, then doing that kind of uh, um, intellectual study, but of, of Jewish Jewish texts. Um, and I'm blinking on the name. So th th that's why I'm not mentioning, not, not uh, for some uh, uh, censorship reasons, but I'm, um, yeah, I I'm not going to try to remember now. Thank you. But thank you, it's a great question. And, and I have an ongoing conversation about um, Salo Baron with uh, Morivan Rabbi, uh, David Engel, about whether to, the extent to which Baron is shaped by very much the same context like um, 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 Mahler and, and, and Friedman and, uh, and uh, earlier uh, Bawaban, or is he more shaped really by his American experience? And I'm of course reading his Galicia, uh, Galician roots into him very powerfully, but I might be overdoing it. Excuse me, was Friedman his student at the Pedagogium? Mm, I don't know that he was. I, they were there. Uh, Friedman finish, uh, finishes in 1922 and okay. returns to Poland to teach at the, at the boys, um, Jewish Boys Gymnasium. Okay. We have three more questions. Uh, I have on my list Jack Jacobs, Susanna Heschel, and Monica Rice. And we have about, you know, just a bit left, less than 20 minutes. So if you can keep your question short, we'll be able to get to all of them. Uh, Jack, please, if you like to. Natalia, first of all, thanks so much for the talk. It was really wonderful. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the whole book. Let me keep this as uh, short as I can. Um, pick up on some of the threads in your remarks and also in Naomi's uh, remarks. Um, one of the points that you were making at the very beginning had to do with the, the fact that amongst the members of this cohort, there is an ideological spread. That is to say that there are people from any number of different um, political tendencies and, and backgrounds and included amongst them, of course, there are orthodox individuals like Hillel, 
Naomi's uh, father and they were Bundists like, like Kunk and, and others. But, and here comes the but that I want you to reflect on. The ideological tendencies are not reflected in this cohort in accord with their prominence or significance in Polish Jewry. It is to say that the Orthodox community is dramatically underrepresented. The Bundist community is dramatically underrepresented and, and, and. What's the group that's overrepresented? Well, you alluded to this as well. It's Linke Polizion. Linke Polizion was a very minor party in interwar uh, Poland, culturally significant, politically insignificant. So I would like you to speak a little bit about what is the import of the fact that amongst the leaders of this cohort, there were any number of people who were actively engaged with Linke Polizion. What impact did it have above all on the research agendas? Yeah, I, I agree that, um, you know, while um, this is not just, uh, again, to play with uh, David Meyer's title, the Zionist return uh, to history, but in some ways it's a Polish Jewish communal project of return to history. Uh, yes, I agree that there is, there is uh, especially among um, the young historian circle, um, quote unquote, over representation of Palacion uh, uh, links and people who are shifting from there to, to communism. Uh, according to um, Rafael Mahler's uh, short uh, biographies. So now I need to say two things. One is um, I would have loved to see the records of the non-existing, obviously, records of Young Historian Circle. And I think that to some extent, if you look at the, 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 the level of detail in those bi precious biographies that um, Mahler uh, um, uh, writes about them, sort of, uh, you know, um, memorializing, especially the majority of them who, who did not survive. Um, there is more about um, his fellow um, um, party members. Um, I'm not entirely sure that this, this proportion would be necessarily so um, stark, so clear and strong if we had uh, more of uh, records of the students, for example, at the Institute of Jewish Studies, the future uh, Institute um, of Jewish History in Warsaw, uh, meaning the future as in the same building because the institutional uh, links of continuity are more, uh, more complex. Um, but thinking aloud, um, I'm a Assuming that, uh, that this is a, a, a project that attracts people uh, interested in uh, filling in um, the, the gap, uh, not just in providing ammunition in the context of accus accusations of Jews being uh, foreign and, and uh, um, dom do dominating Polish economy to the de detriment of the locals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these uh, tropes that we can, we don't need to even read the 1930s press. We can, I think, uh, pretty much imagine what they can be. Um, but I think that part of this filling in, filling in a gap uh, is interest in working class Jews, and this ties together, I think, in a mo more immediate sense with, uh, with left-wing uh, um, inclinations, with working on um, the, the tailors and the shoemakers um, rather than on uh, important rabbis. And so this might be something that uh, brings uh, that particular aspect uh, to the front. And then there is, of course, the question of, of language. Um, on the one hand, if you want to turn the non-Jewish Poles to uh, appreciate Jews and see them as uh, co-citizens, uh, writing and lecturing uh, in Yiddish uh, is uh, not uh, very productive. On the other hand, uh, Palacian links brings uh, 
in a most pro profound way, uh, interest in producing culture and scholarship in Yiddish. And, and um, Ringelblum uh, is more most explicit uh, about it, but, uh, you know, future uh, um, um, important personality in communist Poland, Jakub uh, Berman, uh, brother of Adolf, who is uh, involved in a young historian circle, is also uh, invested in uh, not just filling in the gaps, not just writing about the Jews that have uh, have been missed uh, before uh, in Jewish non-academic uh, scholarship, but also writing uh, writing this and teaching this in Yiddish. Uh, so yeah, maybe maybe this is how, in a very broad sense, uh, that project is tipped. Um, but I think that again. There is so much more, even if numerically uh, um, less uh, less profound. Um, and I'm stopping myself because there are two more questions. But thank you, thank you, Jack, and I'll continue thinking about it. Susanna, please, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thanks. Uh, I'm also looking forward to your book enormously. And I was just curious to know if there was some kind of ongoing relationship with the Polish Academy, Academy de Wissenschaften, because my father's a doctoral dissertation, which he wrote in Berlin in German, uh, was published by the Academy. Uh, and I, so I wonder if it's part of some kind of ongoing relationship. It was very crucial for him to actually receive his PhD, to have it published, and to have the University of Berlin recognized the publication, and that was crucial to his escape from Europe. So what was there an ongoing relationship? Were there other Jewish studies related books published by the Academy? Um, yes. Um, well, the uh, I mentioned that in in Galicia in the early 20th century, there is a milieu of scholars that are interested in um, Sort of educating, um, supporting uh, a generation of, of scholars that would be uh, Jewish scholars uh, of Polish Jewish uh, history, and that continues very much in uh, in the interwar period, especially in Warsaw. Uh, and uh, Marceli Handelsmann, whom I uh, mentioned earlier, and I now regret that I removed from the PowerPoint a very royal picture where he is uh, wearing, you know, the fur and and the chain and all the feudal stuff of university um, uh, uh, university administrator. Um, uh, where, where, uh, uh, so he was very much involved in uh, making sure, or that uh, Jewish students and topics uh, that the Jewish students write about will get uh, funding. Um, so one, one of the examples is Emanuel Ringelblum's work on history of Jews in Warsaw, that was uh, published. Um, because of the subsidy of the prestigious uh, uh, academic uh, foundation. Um, but it's- but this, this was a book on the prophets. It was a book in biblical studies. And I should just say my father was Abraham Joshua Heschel. So it, it wasn't a book of Jewish history. Yes. It was more a book in what you would call Semitics or Oriental study, biblical studies. So I'm just wondering how common or uncommon, is that very unusual? I, I don't know, uh, meaning uh, there are scholars in Polish academia, uh, in the association of historical association in Warsaw in particular, which is very prestigious and uh, uh, sits actually where uh, today the archive of the Polish Academy of Sciences are. Uh, they are interested in, uh, in supporting Jewish scholars or they are interested in supporting scholarship regardless of uh, the background. Uh, whether or not there is a particular uh, um, support for uh, um, scholarship that pertains to uh, religion and, and Jewish textual traditions, I don't know. And my sense is that this is not, uh, this is not something that uh, is extremely common and would meet with some 
uh, opposition. Um, but because again, I've seen it uh, discussed in the protocols with regard to scholars of, of Polish history. Uh, over in that context, the discussion is, well, this is part of Polish history, we should support it. It would be interesting to see what kind of response, what kind of counter argument would be met with the work of your father. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. We have one last, last question from Monica Rice, who's been really patient, I've been waiting. Monica, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Natalia, first of all, for writing this, this work, which I think has um, really is, will fill the gaping hole in historiography, and I think will have a huge influence also on current debates that are happening in Poland. So I'm very grateful that you've, you've made this, this huge effort and, and wrote this. Uh, my question is uh, referring to what you already discussed a little bit about the negotiating of the Jewish historians of their place and what they could say, how they could face and describe violence before the war. And I was, I'm sorry if you discussed it before, I, I had to jump in a little later because I had a lecture this morning. But if um, would you address whether there was any collaboration or if it's too much, maybe a conversation with Polish historians, Polish Gentile historians, who would be open to incorporating and seeing Jewish history as part of Polish history? Or was it more of an insular um, effort uh, project directed to their own community? Thank you. Mm. Um, yes and no, uh, this is a, the best kind of uh, uh, an answer. Um, I, I um, again thinking about Polish uh, Polish historiography today on Jewish history um, um, with uh, some of the uh, leading scholars of Jewish history, Polish Jewish history, and and, and not only uh, who work in Poland. Um, that uh, that cohort uh, seems to be really only. Polish Jews. Uh, there was a moment of um, uh, fake uh, aha that I had uh, many years ago in the archive when I found two uh, non-Jewish uh, Polish um, female students who were taking classes with Balaban. And I uh, started uh, building in that moment a whole theory how this is not only a nonpartisan cohort, but the cohort that is able to uh, um, draw in uh, scholars, young scholars uh, interested in writing about Polish Jews. Uh, but it turned out that they just took uh, individuals class and uh, they were in fact students of Polish literature. Um, Although that in and of itself, I think is important, is, is interesting. Um, there are scholars that are in conversation with Polish Jewish historians. Um, uh, one such example that I would love uh, for, for someone one day to explore further is Wucja Harewiczowa, one of very few female historians to reach the kind of professional recognition that she had in interwar uh, Lviv, Lviv uh, who um, uh, corresponded with uh, Meyer Bałaban. They, they clearly read each other's work, um, but uh, but there was a sense, I think, that um, among uh, liberal Polish historians, that um, Jewish historians are doing Jewish history. Um, and on the other side of, of the political ideological barricade, um, historians who, non-Jewish historians who wrote about Jewish history, for the most part, uh, wrote the kind of history that, that my historians were, wanted to correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. we're, we're near the end of our meeting. I want to thank you all. I want to thank you, Natalia, for uh, writing this book and, and, and uh, giving us a glimpse of the contents of the book. Thank you, Naomi, for your questions. This has been such an enriching conversation. Um, and uh, I will shortly 
uh, end the meeting for all, but I will maybe leave it just a, a little, a few more minutes. So if anybody would like to unmute and, and uh, Francesca, congratulate Natalia or- Can, yeah. you, uh, can you save the, the questions? Because uh, I would love to yeah. think uh, some more, like uh, Susanna's question, for example, uh, I, I think it deserves at least another cup of tea and thinking about it further. And thank you so much for it. Absolutely. So the meeting, this is going to be, re it's recorded and it will be available and I'm, I can also save the, the chat for you and I can send it separately oh, for you. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much again, Naomi and Natalia. This, this was wonderful. Thank you. Thank Francesca. you, Francesca. Thank you, Naomi, so much. And I hope we'll soon meet. <laughs>